Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Roundtable Conversations, where we promote the art of listening. And in order to facilitate some quality listening, we have some ground rules, which I'm going to remind you in a second. Uh, today's topic is the death penalty, uh, pro death penalty or con death penalty. We have two uh, great speakers on board. We have Michael Kroll uh, representing the con position regarding the death penalty. He's the founder of the Death Penalty Information Center. We have Imad Adin, who is the president of the Minaret Institute, Minaret of Freedom Institute, sorry. And he's also a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics, I believe. Astrophysics and astronomy, yes, that's correct. Which is very interesting um, uh, combination of different worlds. Um, our ground table rules for the round table are as follows. The first rule is that all participants are equal in importance. So it doesn't matter your sex, your, your degrees, uh, your position, whatever it is that you um, represent. Once you're in the round table, your importance is, your position is of equal importance. Uh, the second rule is one person speaks at a time. I'm gonna call out the next speaker every time. Uh, there'll be a bell after three minutes, and that means that your time to speak uh, for this round is up. Uh, you can finish your sentence, obviously, but it does mean that you've run out of time to present your position on this point. Uh, the third rule, and this is, this is the crucial and most difficult to implement, uh, when not speaking, members are focused on paying full attention to what is being said. Okay, and we're trying to also understand what is being said, both emotionally and logically. So I don't have to necessarily agree with what is being said. I don't have to hold the other person's position, but I do have to understand, try to understand what he's saying. So it doesn't mean that I change my opposition, but it doesn't mean that I respect it enough to listen to it. Very challenging, but this is the crux of the issue. Our, our fourth rule is we always add to the common pool of knowledge. So we never negate, we never argue. If Michael is going to say, say something that to me sounds preposterous, say, for instance, he's going to claim that the sky is purple, and I know in my heart of hearts that the sky is not purple, it's blue. Instead of saying, I disagree, instead of saying, uh, Michael is wrong, I simply say, I believe that the sky is blue. So simply present your own position without negating, without arguing other people's position, even if you did, especially if you disagree. Uh, the last rule is we talk to the point. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting questions for each round and we're gonna try to stick to the point. That's also why we have a three minute limit. Um, so just try to stick to the topic, to the content of the question and not go all over the place with it. And that's it, without any further ado, let us get started. So for the first round, we'll just do a short introduction. Um, why don't, uh, Imad Adin, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are and how you got to your current position. <clears throat> okay, well, um, uh, I am a uh, Palestinian refugee. I was born on a boat as my mother was coming here during the Nekba in 1948. Um, I was raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to, uh, got my undergraduate degree at Harvard University in astronomy and then got a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Arizona. Um, and in the 1980s, I uh, changed fields uh, when I realized that the, uh, uh, the so-called experts on Islam were anything but, uh, since they didn't see the Iranian revolution coming and in retrospect, their explanations of it were, were incoherent. Um, I made the transition of fields by writing a book called Signs in the Heavens, a Muslim Astronomer's Perspective on Religion and Science, which was about the role Islam played in the development of modern science. And uh, later became, uh, because of the success of that book, I got a position teaching in the honors program on Islamic civilization at the University of Maryland and started the Minaret of Freedom Institute, which is the Muslim think tank I now head. I've uh, been a lifelong uh, 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 activist in libertarian politics, uh, including running for Senate uh, as a libertarian twice in the state of Maryland. And so I have an interest in all kinds of political issues, not just those related to religion in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, as far as the death penalty is concerned, I uh, introduced a um, motion at the recent Libertarian Party National Convention calling for a moratorium on the death penalty. It was amended from the floor to be against the death penalty. Uh, and so went somewhat beyond the, the position uh, I'll be defending here. 
Well, um, that was a very interesting uh, introduction. Glad to meet you. My name is Michael Kroll. Um, I am a, a California by birth resident, although I have lived uh, in many places. I was a graduate from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, was arrested the first time in the free speech movement in 1964, which gives you a sense of how old I am, <laughs> uh, and have been a writer uh, all, uh, for 40 years, a journalist and a writer on issues almost entirely related to America's criminal justice system in general and the death penalty in particular. Because of that writing, I was asked in 1990 to found a new organization in Washington, D.C. called the Death Penalty Information Center, which is a, a, a neutral uh, repository of information and data and statistics which governments and uh, uh, journalists rely on for their reporting about the death penalty. I would say that my views of the death penalty began very, very early around the dinner table. Uh, I grew up in a, in a very politically active family, uh, pro-labor family, I would say. Uh, so there were many issues that we discussed around that table, but the death penalty grabbed me very early uh, when I learned that uh, every, every capital uh, punishment trial is the people of whatever state it's in, in California, the people of California versus that individual who's uh, being sentenced to death. I always thought of myself as one of those people of California. So it grabbed me that I was being asked and actually being forced to be part of a judicial system that makes very conscious, deliberate, very cold-blooded decisions along the way that ends in me being part of a force that kills an individual, me being uh, one of those people of California. That I couldn't tolerate. Um, uh, I felt my own sense of responsibility. And so uh, actually the first thing I ever had published was a letter to the editor when I was 12 years old, and it was about my opposition to the death penalty. So that's my longest political uh, objective. I've had many, um, but that's the one that has grabbed me and uh, kept my writing going uh, for quite some years now. I think that probably just about uh, encapsulates my life. I, I have lived in Malaysia, where I was a teacher. I've lived in Japan, where I was a teacher. I have traveled around the country, where I have been a teacher of English as a second language. Uh, so all the time while I've been writing, I've also been making a, what passes for a living as, as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very beautiful. So we have a very eclectic uh, base here. We have uh, a very interesting, varied um, professional history with um, Dean, and we have a very interesting geographic <laughs> experience with Michael. So after our next question, which is really the first one on topic, and that is, what do you think is the purpose of the death penalty? Why have the death penalty? Why not have it? What are we trying to achieve with the society by having it on the books? And uh, Dean, please take it away. <clears throat> well, I think there are multiple purposes uh, uh, that have been put forward in defense of the death penalty. For one thing, uh, the issue of uh, deterrence that if you know that if you take a life, your life is uh, at, at risk is uh, something that people hope will give pause to anyone who's considering doing that. The, um, uh, the, the fact, for example, that people argue that you should not give the death penalty for minor crimes because then it's someone trying to uh, protect themselves from being caught in that minor crime might then go on to kill someone in the attempt to protect himself, uh, if he thinks the penalty is going to be the same whether he kills someone or not, is a testimony to the fact uh, that, that uh, many people consider that an effective deterrent. Um, uh, another argument is that uh, it's uh, a uh, moral statement that you, if you do not value the life of others, then you cannot claim the right to your own life. And that when someone uh, murders someone else that they have given up their 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 own life um, uh, uh, another um, uh, uh, argument is uh, to uh, uh, to simply eliminate those people from society um, uh, because uh, of the fact that they are not the people uh, people who may go on to kill again 
uh, are not someone that you want to have at large in society. Uh, of course, um, uh, this last argument is rebutted by the fact, well, you can always put them in life for prison without possibility of parole. And while some people have argued that uh, that's not a good argument because uh, uh, that, that, uh, because uh, of the expense that's involved in keeping someone in life in prison. Uh, I don't consider that a strong argument myself because in this system that we have in the United States, you can always appeal the death penalty. And of course, uh, it's been demonstrated that you spend more money uh, on people who are appealing the death sentence against them than you do uh, on uh, uh, people for whom uh, there, there is no death sentence in question, uh, but they've just been put in prison for life from the beginning. Um, I think there are other arguments that have been put forward, and, and on um, uh, Mr. Carl's web website you can find them. Uh, but I think these are the three strongest arguments, and so they're the three I'm going to put forward and stop. So I, I have some uh, some differences, um, although uh, I think maybe uh, my so-called opponent is speaking as much against the death penalty as for it. <laughs> but let me let me say what I think. Deterrence is often advanced as a justification for the death penalty. That is, um, you know, if we execute you, you're not going to, someone else is not going to commit that crime. I, I once had a, I was testifying in front of the Senate, and a senator said to me, well, uh, you know, I, there's a road in my town, and whenever my son is with me, and I'm going too fast, he says, there's a cop up at the end of that uh, road and he'll get you. And that is a deterrent argument and I slow down. And my answer was, yes, the death penalty is a deterrent for speeding, but it is not a deterrent for murder because murderers either are acting on impulse, which is the most common murder, or they are well-planned conscious uh, efforts in which being caught doesn't figure in. So the death penalty doesn't figure in. And, and, and better than my argument about it are the data about it. Um, I, I'm reading now from the New York Times, 10 of the 12 states without the death penalty have homicides rates below the national average, whereas half of the states with the death penalty have homicide rates above the national average. If deterrence were working, those statistics would not be what they are. And so having looked at this for, for many, many years, having even had the terrible experience of witnessing California's first execution in the, in the modern era, um, I have come to the conclusion that the real reason uh, that we impose capital punishment and carry it out in this country has to do with uh, almost religious rituals. It's a right, it's a sacrifice, it's a human sacrifice, which in many countries I think has been uh, symbolized by other acts that take the place of the actual execution. We haven't come that far yet in this country. We're still mired in a kind of uncivilized muck of the past. We're moving in that direction. The number of executions is dramatically lower than it was just 10 years ago. The support for the death penalty is reduced each year. So we are we're moving away from that muck of, uh, of uncivilization. Um, uh, in the meantime, we are in the company of such, uh, you know, such countries as China and uh, Syria and Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, all these, uh, Pakistan, all these uh, great countries of, uh, of execution, great by the numbers of people they execute. We're in that company. We are not in the company of all of Europe, which has abandoned the death penalty. All of South America, Mexico, Canada, all of those countries have abandoned the death penalty. Almost every country that's ever gone through colonial uh, imposition, being a colonial uh, uh, a colony of another country, have quickly abandoned the death penalty as uh, one of their very first acts because they have seen how the death penalty can easily be used as a political tool uh, over and above the judicial uh, justifications that are advanced. So, so I think it is a human sacrifice, a ritual, a right, and a very speci specific American right because we're this polyglot of, of religion. So it's, it's come down to our, our judicial system, which provides our religious rituals. Interesting position. I definitely haven't heard their human sacrifice right just yet, but it's very, very interesting. And it's an expense, of course. Um, 
I'm going to circle back to the question of is the death penalty effective as a deterrent for crime? Because I feel like while uh, Dean brought it up, he didn't really address whether he thinks it is and, and it isn't and why not, and then you'll get a chance to to um, keep on presenting your position answer why you think it, it, it isn't. So is the death penalty effective as a deterrent for crime? Dean, take it away. I'm actually open-minded on this. Um, I, I um, follow the, the studies that are put in, but the studies give you different, different results. Uh, to the point that, that um, one looks at areas where there is uh, the death penalty, where it's actually applied frequently, and one finds that there's a lot of murders. Uh, and in other places where it is not so frequently applied, there is often not so many murders. Uh, this may be a case of mixing up the cart and the horse. Um, it's like the argument, even though I myself am a very strong defender of the Second Amendment, frankly, people who say, oh, you have uh, much more uh, murders in, in Washington, D.C. or in Chicago where you, uh, you, know, uh, where you have uh, gun control than in areas where you don't have gun control, to me is overlooking the fact that one of the reasons that people may implement the laws against uh, owning of guns is because they have a serious problem with murder. And so you've got the cart and the horse reversed. I think the same thing may be happening here. When you look at areas where there is a lot of uh, executions, uh, it may be because it's a place where there's a lot of murders and therefore people are motivated. Uh, both they have the opportunity because there are a lot of uh, accusations and therefore they have a lot of uh, 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 both motivation and opportunity uh, to have more uh, death penalties. So it doesn't really say that it's not effective uh, because uh, th th that would require a much more um, nuanced study uh, that I'm still waiting to see. Uh, on the other hand, I do have to say that the uh, risk of the death penalty being used as a political factor is something that I'm very concerned about. And also, by the way, as a form of racial uh, pr prejudice or even genocide uh, is something that I'm concerned about. Uh, however, uh, it is for this reason that I am in favor of a indefinite moratorium on the death penalty as a better way of addressing that rather than to make what I think is ultimately an unsustainable claim uh, that the death penalty is inherently immoral. Um, one last point I want to make on this. I think that the role of the families of the victims should be, their, their position and their view should be taken into account uh, on the question of whether someone should be subject to the death penalty or not. Um, um, and, uh, and finally, one last point, I guess I, I also want to stick in here. I think that one has to consider a, this, a higher standard of proof. We think that we have a high standard of proof in criminal cases because we require it to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. I think when the death penalty is involved, it should be beyond any doubt whatsoever, including an unreasonable doubt. If I'm sitting on a jury and I say, well, you know, I can't really name a reason why I think this person is innocent, but I'm just not comfortable with giving the death penalty, I think that should be sufficient to vote against it. Um. I would accept Dean on my jury uh, any day. I think he would make a very fine juror in a capital case. Um, you know, the, the notion of deterrence, as I, as I mentioned before, works if you're talking about speeding or if you're talking about shoplifting or if you're talking about those crimes where you actually consider uh, what the consequences might be and are willing to go ahead and do the act anyway. Murder is quite different. And Beyond the statistics, which you're right, could be, uh, you know, which is cause and which is effect, there is an effect which has been, uh, which has been researched and confirmed. It's an effect that I called uh, the Tylenol effect. If you're old enough to remember, there was a period, uh, a brief period in uh, American history, not, you know, within my lifetime, where someone laced uh, aspirin or some, some uh, analgesic with uh, Tylenol was with, with um, cyanide and a person died. Suddenly there was a rash of these kinds of, uh, of, of uh, what do I want to say, of people uh, polluting uh, uh, medicines on shelves. Once it became public that someone else had done it, there seems to be uh, a group of people, mentally ill people, who are always on the verge 
uh, and need some kick in the pants to push them over that verge into territory where they should not be, beyond their thinking and into action. And that's what I call the Tylenol effect. So if you measure the rate of murder in, say, a 100-mile radius of an execution spot in any state, where the most publicity of that execution is going to happen. The murder rate actually jumps uh, within a 30 to 40 day period. So some, it appears that some people are motivated or, uh, or given permission. Uh, government as teacher is probably the government's biggest uh, function, whether it intends to teach or not, it does teach by its actions. So I am suggesting that far from deterrence, the death penalty may actually be a stimulant to homicide. Um, and, and then, you know, we have 20,000 homicides in this country a year. 20,000 people are murdered a year in this country. We execute a tiny fraction uh, of those people. And I don't think any, uh, even the most ardent advocate of capital punishment would suggest that we should be executing 20,000 people a year. So how is it that that few, those very few, that select group um, uh, who are selected in a very capricious and arbitrary way, by the way, which often depends on the amount of money they have as well as their, their own backgrounds, social backgrounds, as well as economic backgrounds. Um, how is it that that very tiny select group uh, becomes this uh, stand-in for deterrence when the, you know, 19,600 of the 20,000 uh, are sentenced to something less than death. No, I don't think that, they, that you can draw a relationship between capital punishment and, and deterrence. People who commit murder are not going to be deterred by a penalty they don't think is going to apply to them because they are not going to be caught. They, their calculation is freedom. Uh, not not getting caught. Otherwise, you, you'd have to imagine, uh, you know, a couple of murderers sitting in their kitchen saying, now, wait a minute, we're in California, we have the death penalty, we better move to Hawaii and commit this murder because they don't have the death penalty in Hawaii. That is a, a, a fanciful kind of conversation to imagine. Okay, and um, our next question is going to be, um, does the death penalty provide closure for families of victims? Does the death penalty provide any kind of closure, uh, feeling better about it for the families of victims? Uh, Dean, please take it away. Well, I think this is going to depend on the family, and that's why I believe they should have <clears throat> a role in making the decision as to whether the death penalty should be applied or not. Um, personally, I believe that there's an opportunity through the act of, of forgiveness and mercy to achieve closure, uh, as well as by through the act of uh, uh, of retaliation, uh, but this is going to this is going to differ from person to person, and I think that the family of the victim has the right to to, to weigh in on that uh, more than I, as an observer, uh, have the right to, to weigh in on that. Um, I don't know if it's um, um, well, I'll just. That, that's all I have to say on that on that question. Michael? Yes, let me let me say this about that because I have worked on behalf of uh, many people who either are facing trial, capital trial, or have already been sentenced and are going back for appeal or other uh, avenues that might reduce the death sentence to something less, life in prison. So I have met many families who are survivors that is, have had a family member who has been murdered. It is always a terrible kind of meeting. I hate those meetings, but I do it uh, because, first of all, I think those people are owed a direct uh, meeting with someone who opposes the execution of their loved one's killer. In no case have I ever, ever found that the execution of that murderer brought them closure. Closure is a political statement that serves politicians. It's a wonderful argument to make. I bring you the head of this man and you can then close the account of your father's murder, your mother's murder, your child's murder. It doesn't work that way. And you easily think of your own situation, all of us, all of our situations that 
if we were to lose someone in, that we cared about to murder, there really is no way to close the hole that is filled in our, in our hearts and our souls. Time does some things, but it doesn't do all things. We will always have, even when people that we love die of natural causes, we have a hole that can't be closed by any sort of a hallmark card uh, sentiment that this will bring you closure. No, I think that that's a, a political statement, not a, a statement that actually works for real families. I absolutely uh, agree that families should have a role in deciding penalty. I just think that the, the highest penalty to be considered should it be life and not death. I don't believe, I don't want to be a killer myself. I mean, basically that's my, my principal argument that the death penalty makes me a killer. And, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, well, does he have the right to live? That's a question I can't answer. I only can answer the question whether I have a right to kill. And I've decided I, I don't have that right. I note that uh, for governments, uh, you know, listening to the, the victim's family often works only when those families agree with what the government wants to do anyway. I note in South Carolina, when uh, the young man went into the church and murdered uh, those, those beautiful people uh, praying that invited him in and were cordial with him and then he pulled his gun out and killed them because they were black. Those family members pleaded with the government not to pursue the death penalty. And the government simply ignored them because it was in the interest of the politicians to seek the death penalty and then go to the next election to say, you see, I am tough on crime, uh, and and so vote for me. The 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 views of the of the families that were that were hurt meant nothing to those politicians. So um, it, it doesn't work. It, it's a good sentiment, but it doesn't work. Politicians work for their own interests uh, far too often, rather than the interests of the people they claim they're working on behalf of. Um, so this brings me to our next question. Um, do you think that there is any type of crime, that any crime for which the death penalty would be appropriate, or there's a crime that's so horrific that anything less would, um, would, would be demeaning to the value of life? Yeah. Uh, uh Dean, please. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, if, if murder is an example of such a crime, and I think it is, uh, then certainly mass murder would have to be such an example. Uh, the case that was just referred to would be one, but another one would be the, uh, uh, the, the synagogue in, uh, in Pittsburgh where so many people were killed. Uh, it is hard for me to imagine how someone could claim that someone who deliberately engaged in that kind of crime uh, still had the right to life so that if we were to execute him in a judicial process with the consent of the of the, the families of the victims and so on and so forth, that somehow we were as guilty of murder as this person was. Just on the numbers alone, it can be the case. If someone kills 13 people or 30 people or 2,000 people and we uh, kill them, uh, if we're guilty of a crime, it is a fraction of the, of the crimes they have done. Uh, but I do not think that is the case. Um, and I think that when one, even if one believes that such an action has no deterrent effect on others, one has to concede that it will prevent that person from ever implementing it again. And if one believes that uh, people are more concerned about freedom than they are about death, I would argue that I think that varies from person to person. There are some people for whom life in prison is worse than death, and those are the ones that you got to make sure don't commit suicide when they're in prison. Uh, which they may end up doing. And then you have to ask yourself if you feel that you are guilty of killing people uh, when you authorize the state to act in your name, um, then have you in some way been guilty of their provoking their suicide by putting them in prison for life? Michael? Yeah. Well, I am less concerned with provoking someone's suicide. As a matter of fact, uh, I've often said, if uh, you want to take yourself out uh, on death row or in prison in general, you have absolutely every right to do that, as I have that right myself. It can be done. No, I am worried about uh, judicial execution, that is, 
providing a law under which a citizen can be tried, convicted, and then stoned to death, burned to death, put in the electric chair, put in the gas chamber. The, the execution I saw was a gas chamber execution. Just absolutely grotesque. As to the question of whether or not there are some crimes that are so heinous or the number of victims so large that the death penalty is justified, for me, it is a question of principle. It is a line beyond which I cannot personally go. So no, there is no crime that I would say justifies the taking of a life. In fact, it seems to me, I was once giving a talk and a, a little uh, first grade student, literally a first grader raised his hand and said, but didn't they tell me that two wrongs don't make a right? Now that sounds very simplistic, but it's, it's pretty profound when you really think about it, that we're punishing the act of murder by ourselves committing a homicide and every execution is listed, cause of death is homicide. Um, it, it absolutely defies, to me, it absolutely defies logic that we do to you what you did to him to teach you that what you did to him was wrong, we're now gonna use the same method. That seems to me uh, uh, very wrong. As to whether or not people are more punished or less punished in prison, um, you know, all punishment ceases when life ceases. You are no longer being punished when you have no sense, when you have no brain, when you have no life. But prison is a permanent punishment. It is a continuing punishment. Uh, whether a person there can find life and meaning and purpose, that's up to them. I hope so, to be honest with you. Um, because a purposeful life is better than one without purpose. And, and uh, I must tell you that I uh, spend a lot of time at San Quentin State Prison doing writing programs uh, in which I am surrounded by men who in their, almost always in their youth, some uh, in their teens, committed murder. Now they are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and their lives, their brains, their view of the world, their view of themselves has radically changed so that many of them, I think, would uh, be very uh, strong contributors to a better society uh, if they were out because they've had time to examine their lives. That is what time in prison has given them. Whether or not we ever want to let them out, a different a different matter. Um, so, I think that if you if you say um, you demean life by not imposing the death penalty, you have to go back to that twenty thousand homicides every year. It means that all those homicide uh, uh, committers who did not get the death penalty, their victims were demeaned. I don't think you could make that argument. Uh, it would mean that only a very, very few uh, at the very top, this sort of, uh, I want to say the cream of the, uh, of, the, of the top, but it's actually the bottom, the bottom little the scum. They are the ones who would have the ultimate penalty and everyone else would be uh, feel um, cheated because their their crimes didn't rise or fall to the level that to deserved capital punishment. I think that if we cap the punishment of death, I'm sorry, life without uh, parole, which even that has uh, certain cruel uh, aspects to it, but if we capped it there, uh, then we could not make the argument that your crime was so heinous that it deserved the ultimate penalty, but your crime was not, and, and we're sorry, but your, your murderer only got prison and not death. Let's, let's try to wrap it up because that was your time, Michael. Okay. Okay, great. So you've brought us to my next question, Michael, and uh, that question is, uh, is life sacred? Does the death penalty safeguard the sanctity of life if it has sanctity, or does it abuse it? And if you're, wait a second, that's Dean's round. <laughs> okay. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that life is, is sacred, and I think that um, to the, 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 the question is not, should not be uh, whether it is just wrong to take any life, but rather whether there is a justifiable homicide as opposed to an unjustifiable homicide. If one wants to take the position that no homicide is ever justifiable in any case whatsoever, then one has to address the question about, does that mean that we should not defend ourselves? Is lethal self-defense 
unacceptable morally, flatly to be rejected. If someone breaks into my house and is going to kill my wife and children and me, uh, do I have to take off the table the possibility of lethal self-defense? Uh, and am I, in doing so, am I not giving greater respect to the people who engage in criminal activity than to the people who engage in activity that, in my opinion, is justifiable because it is a defense of rights rather than an abrogation of them. So the problem I'm having with, uh, with Dean's analysis is the difference between an individual's act and the act of a government. Uh, Self-defense, which is uh, something one could argue uh, back and forth. I've heard uh, very persuasive arguments uh, saying that self-defense is always justified, as well as arguments saying it never is, and that may or may not depend on your religious views, your, your views of life and death. But those are individual choices. I am talking about the government. The government does not need the self-defense of capital punishment, because capital punishment, of course, is... Uh, putting to death uh, our slaves because uh, prison is justified. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, made an exception for prison. So prison is filled with our current slaves, constitutional slaves. You do not need to protect yourself from slaves by killing them. They're already in your custody. You already have total control of their lives, their movement, uh, when they wake, when they sleep, how they sleep what the conditions are that they live in. So the, the notion that we have to kill them to protect ourselves seems fanciful to me. Uh, another uh, political justification, but not uh, one uh, mired in reality. The other problem I have is that each of us has our own personal list of what uh, are heinous crimes, what crimes deserve death, what crimes deserve life, what crimes deserve high penalty, what crimes don't. And the fact that we each have our own differences creates a, a, the possibility for all manner of uh, misuse, abuse, particularly government abuse. Uh, we've seen it most recently, at least most recently in, in, a, in a large way, with the, the Saudi government's decision to murder and dismember a critic of their government um, within, the, within their own uh, consulate in a foreign country. Um, that was a political decision that they justified, whether or not I could justify it or you could justify it, they could justify it by saying the, the penalty, in this case capital punishment, though there was no process, was worth the, the doing, whatever the consequences were, were worth it because it, it, we can justify taking this man out. In other words, what government does, they do in a very conscious, very cold-blooded way, a series of decisions. This decision leads to arrest. This decision leads to indictment. This decision leads to the conclusion that uh, we are going to seek the death penalty. This decision leads to the picking of a jury and so forth. All these discrete decisions are very cold-blooded and very calculated. That's very different from self-defense. Um, what is the difference between, what is the difference, if there is any, between state-sanctioned execution and an individual seeking revenge, not self-defense, but revenge through murder, whether it's a blood feud that goes on that was actually, to my understanding, like a legal system in the past in some areas of the world, or just I'm going to murder the murderer of my family. What is the difference, if any, between state sanctioned execution and an individual seeking revenge through murder? Dean, please take it away. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, parse your question because I think that uh, one has to make a distinction between uh, a revenge or retaliation as a collective act and uh, a, an act of retaliation against the individual who committed the murder. Uh, I think that it's a red herring to bring in the question of whether it's the state who does it or the individual who does it, because it evades what I think is the really fundamental question that we're trying to address here. If, uh, if, if, if the state doesn't kill the man who murdered my family, and I go out and I do it, 
to say that, oh, well, that's different because that's the act of an individual seems to be avoiding the whole question that we're trying to address about the morality, the effectiveness and the appropriateness of a death penalty. Uh, we have to make the same uh, standard apply to individuals uh, that we apply to the state. And I say this not because I'm any fan of the state. As a, as a libertarian, I'm more suspicious of the state than anybody else. But we have to look at the facts. The Khashoggi uh, murder was not defended by the Saudis as a just act of retribution. They denied anyone at the top. They said it was rogue agents who were involved, people who got out of hand, who didn't know what they were doing, who were not authorized. In other words, they're actually using this argument that there's a distinction between the state and that of individual actors as a means of defending themselves from the consequences. The consequences would be, in an ideal society, that the people who were responsible, and by the people who are responsible, I don't just mean the ones who did the deed, but the ones who ordered it at the very top, for them to be subject to the worst possible punishment. The worst possible punishment obviously being death. Again, I have to clarify that because of the fact that the death penalty is so abused by the state, that I myself am in favor of an indefinite moratorium. But when we're talking about these fundamental moral questions, I think we have to ask the moral questions in a, in a way uh, that, that addresses them directly and not try to say, well, the state is such an unreliable actor that it's sufficient to prevent the state from engaging in these activities. If we really believe that any homicide is a moral atrocity, then any homicide done by anyone, including an act of self-defense, must be a moral atrocity. I do not share that view. I, I prefer to take the topic of self-defense off the table, at least temporarily for the purposes of this discussion, because I do think it's in another category. It's That's that uh, when someone's attacking you personally, whether you have the right to defend yourself to the extent of taking that person's life. I think that is a, a separate argument, a separate discussion that we can have. The problem that I have uh, with state-sanctioned execution as opposed to individual homicide is that that action by the state involves me. I am part of the state. So uh, however you want to define it, when the people of California or whatever state you happen to live in uh, impose and enact uh, a death sentence, they have implicated me in that act of homicide. That is the problem I have with it. That and the fact that in an individual case, there is hot blood and passion, all of which we recognize. All of us have been passionate uh, in anger as well as in love. So we recognize that human, those human emotions the state acts without passion, a very cold-blooded uh, calculation that leads to uh, what I, some of my friends would call murder. I don't call it murder because murder is a legal uh, term. Um, it does lead to a homicide, though, a homicide in my name. Uh, that's the problem I have. As, as for being a libertarian who could support the death penalty, to me that seems to be a... a, a uh, canceling out phrase. That is, libertarians believe in the least amount of government control. The death penalty is the most amount of government power to give the state the power under law to select an individual, a citizen of the state, and put that person through a legal process that ends with his or her death uh, by means of state uh, apparatus. That is, as a, that is as diametrically opposed to my understanding of what libertarianism is as anything that I can imagine. In other words, if you give the state the ultimate power to kill an individual, what power can you deny the state? So it seems like, <clears throat> Michael, you hold the position that you don't want to be a part of state-sanctioned homicide and that we are at risk if we give the state the power to execute people. And um, Dean, you feel that if you say that homicide of in any case is abhorrent, then uh, that also lumps in self-defense and you believe that people have the right to self-defense and from there you take it that we should be able to execute people if necessary. I, I, I want to take this conversation to... Um, 
a little bit of another direction. This is something that Dean brought up. Uh, do you think that there is a racial bias to the implementation of the death penalty in the USA? Uh, and what do you think we should do about it if there is one? Do you think that there's a racial bias to the implementation of the death penalty in the USA? And what do you think we should do? We should do about it, B. Uh, to answer your question directly, yes, I think there is a racial bias, and I think that the uh, thing we should do about it is have an immediate uh, suspension of the death penalty again, indefinite. Um, uh, however, I want to point out that it's not just in the death penalty itself that this racial bias appears. We see it in the actions of police officers on the front lines who are more likely to shoot uh, uh, black people or Hispanic people uh, uh, in the act of uh, doing their duty on the street, supposedly. And that raises a, 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 another interesting question. If you believe that it is an atrocity for the state to act in, to commit homicide in your name, any homicide, justifiable or not, uh, then one would say, so then you would think that it is wrong for the, for the policeman who sees the gunman entering the synagogue to use lethal force to stop the gunman, because he would be doing that in our name. Uh, and it would be an act of homicide. So uh, these are the questions that I think have to be addressed if one is going to take this position that under any circumstances whatsoever, um, uh, homicide is is never never truly justifiable. By the way, I, I have to say, uh, sometimes people confuse libertarianism with anarchism. Uh, I'm reminded of a uh, very hardcore anarchist whom I had a debate on a similar question one time, uh, who didn't want this, uh, the state to uh, to do anything really in the pursuit of justice. And I said, well, but if uh, you would not, if, if someone were about to attack someone in a public park, uh, you wouldn't want to prevent a police officer from defending that person, would you? And he said, no, but I wouldn't want to encourage him. Michael, please unmute yourself and take it away. All right. Well, you know, I must say, uh, as a so-called opponent uh, debating this issue, I'll take Dean any day. Um, I certainly will accept an indefinite uh, suspension of the death penalty, as he proposes, a permanent moratorium, as he proposes. Those are, uh, those are positions that I can certainly live with. Um, as to the question of race, I think that nobody could deny that racism plays a very fundamental role in all of our criminal justice processes, from the first arrest we're talking about all the way to executing people. There is a very famous case that reached the United States Supreme Court in 1987 called uh, Kemp versus McCleskey. The McCleskey case brought with it uh, very, very persuasive and convincing data showing that particularly the race of the victim uh, is determining, uh, will determine who does and who does not get the death penalty. Uh, that is to say, if you kill a white person in this country, you're far more likely to get the death penalty than if you kill a black person. If you yourself are a white person who kills a white person, you're less likely to get the death penalty than if you were a black person killing a white person and so forth. But it is this race of victim where black people are, uh, are not valued. That is, if you kill a black person, you're very unlikely to get the death penalty. Um, the court accepted the data. They did not dispute the data. What they said basically was, in a 5-4 decision, if we apply this data to the death penalty, we will then be forced to apply it to our entire criminal justice system. And what would that do to our prison system? We'd have to start turning people out. We'd have to start rewriting laws. We'd have to protect people who are victims of this racial bias. So rather than sort of upturn the entire apple cart, they accepted the validity of the data and then ignored its power in their decision and upheld the death penalty by a single vote. So yes, racism plays a very important, racism and classism. I mean, um, there's a statement, uh, them without the capital get the punishment. And I think that's uh, virtually true in every case. Uh, the issues of capital punishment, race, class, 
uh, impoverishment of both the money, spirit, background, education, all those things are uh, virtually a part of every death sentence uh, in America. Um, I, you guys brought up my next question, and the question is, what is the difference between the act of self-defense and the act of executing or or killing somebody in revenge after the fact, after there's no longer any danger to society or an individual. What is the difference of any between self-defense and killing somebody after the fact, after he's no longer an active threat? Dean. Well, I, I, it seems to me that the answer to that question is self-evident. Uh, an act of self-defense is where the action is being required in order to prevent the crime for which you would later want to avenge. Uh, whereas the act of, of, of revenge, uh, I would prefer saying retribution or punishment, uh, is the act after he succeeded in doing the crime uh, in order to uh, to render some sort of punishment for having committed the crime. Um, so um, in a sense, if you're talking about deterrence, the deterrent power of an act of self-defense is more obvious than the deterrent, the claimed deterrent power of uh, of an act of punishment, uh, and and that's, uh, I think that's pretty clear. I I don't think I can add anything to what Dean said. I agree entirely with that uh, description. Uh, Self defense is a is an immediate act to prevent uh, one's own or someone else's uh, endangerment and even death, whereas. Uh, any process that punishes that act afterwards has a very different motive and a very different effect. It's not going to change the outcome of whatever the crime was. You can't bring someone back uh, after they are dead. But it, it, it is uh, so. So it's a fundamentally different uh, kind of, of 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 act of process. One is often cold blooded. That's the that's the reactionary one, the one that comes after the fact. One is very, very hot-blooded, which is immediate flight or, or fight kind of, uh, of human uh, response. So my next question is, innocent, innocent people have been on death row. Um, it is likely that, is the risk of executing an innocent person a reason to abolish the death row? Is there a uh, risk of executing an innocent person a reason to abolish the death penalty? Um, not necessarily. I think that uh, it, the, the fact that uh, some innocent person might, uh, 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 might be killed is better addressed by addressing the process by which we decide who gets killed and, 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 and under what circumstances. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, I believe that it is not sufficient for a jury to authorize the death penalty because it, they convince, they're convinced that the person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It has to be beyond any doubt whatsoever. If I were on a jury, it would take a very, very strong argument uh, by the prosecution uh, to convince me to be comfortable with the death penalty. In a case like the slaughter in, in Pittsburgh, where there were lots of eyewitnesses and uh, uh, there, there's, there's, there's little, uh, actually there's no room for doubt. Uh, I think that might be a case where I might be willing to support the death penalty, uh, were it not for my general, uh, uh, belief that there should be an indefinite suspension. Michael? So, you know, interestingly enough, innocence, uh, in this country is according to the Supreme Court, not constitutional grounds for invalidating a death sentence. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution the court has held that says just because you're innocent after the fact, after due process has found you guilty, does not entitle you to, to freedom, does not entitle you to relief. You have to bring other constitutional grounds, which is just an interesting aside in this country. Frankly, I avoid the uh, I, I definitely believe, of course, that uh, executing an innocent person is enough to invalidate that system. That is, one innocent life taken is too many innocent lives taken. On the other hand, my opposition 
to the death penalty is not based on innocence or guilt. Uh, I think it, anyone who would suggest that an innocent person could justifiably be put to death is, is someone whom I couldn't argue with because we view life so entirely differently that there'd be no grounds uh, for conversation. It's the others, it's the guilty ones that I oppose capital punishment for because I believe it implicates me in the same act that we are now holding them responsible for committing. Um, is there a national interest that justifies the death penalty, Dean? Is there a national interest that justifies the death penalty over the interests of the individual or the interests of the families over the interest of whether I want to participate in it? Is there an overarching interest for the nation to have this option on the table, Dean? I, I do not see one. Um, in my view, uh, uh, the actions of the na and nation state uh, are uh, in our name, and therefore they can have no powers, no authority, and no interest beyond those of the people that they claim to be acting on, on behalf. And uh, if I were pushed to try to make a distinction between the interests of the nation state and the interests of the people, I would probably end up uh, 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 taking the position that I think has been articulated uh, 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 that... Uh, uh, the, the state is less trustworthy uh, than the individual, and therefore there is a greater risk. Michael? Yeah, I, again, uh, I find little to disagree with uh, Dean about. Uh, the state is uh, inherently untrustworthy. The state actors have their own agendas, their own motives, and often we, the people, even in the most uh, kind of uh, uh, open and, and democratic societies we claim to have here, only learn many, many years later of real motives behind state action. I, I think that uh, you've seen even in, in non-capital uh, situations just this week, how politicians will go to the mat to defend their own actions, even completely flying in the face of democracy, basically saying, we don't believe in democracy, we believe in our power. And that's what's going on in Wisconsin, that's what's going on in Michigan, that's what's going on in North Carolina, that's what's going on in Ohio, that's what's going on in any number of Florida, any number of places where the politicians view their views as more important than what the people have decided they want. So I will never trust the government over and above individual uh, citizens of the people. The people are uh, what empower this government, uh, and it is the people who must be the fundamental uh, deciders and not the politicians who, uh, who take on power and then use it to basically maintain the power that they've got. Is the death penalty is the death penalty constitutional? Is it on the face of the constitution, or is it well within the framework of the constitution? Dean. Uh, well, you'll find people who make arguments on both sides, and I think the breakdown is uh, pretty much um, aligns with the questions about whether one looks at the the originalist interpretation of the Constitution or the living Constitution. Uh, clearly, the uh, founders. Uh, uh, believe that in in the permissibility of the death penalty since you have restrictions on when it can be applied placed in the constitution so they're not they're not saying that in every case it is prohibited um, uh, but then uh, the other side argues that well you know we have to uh, when we're, we're talking about cruel and unusual punishment which is prohibited by the constitution uh, we have to gauge that according to current standards um, um, I think that uh, according to current standards, if you took a poll among the people, you would find that uh, uh, people to a large degree still pretty are, much are comfortable with, with the death penalty. Uh, and even though I do, I have argued that in principle, it, uh, it, there's nothing morally uh, prohibitive of the death penalty. Uh, I think that actually the general population is probably more accepting of it in practice than I am. Uh, uh, so, so it seems to me, whether you're talking about a living constitution or original intent, uh, the death penalty is still uh, allowed for by the constitution. Michael. 
Yeah, I, I think that uh, Dean is right again. That is to say, those who wrote the Constitution, those those slave holding, property holding white men who wrote this document, uh, certainly believed in the death penalty uh, and put in uh, protections against its use, due process, uh, for example. But to put in protections means you believe it can be used when those protections are provided. Um, currently, the Supreme Court of the United States has been asked this question numerous times and uh, has at some time, uh, in some cases, overturned the death penalty as applied. Ironically, uh, in uh, 1960, oh, one, two, or three, I'm not quite sure, two, I think, in any case, the Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty was unconstitutional as applied because it was capricious and arbitrary. It struck like lightning. You could not predict who among the qualified uh, reservoir people would actually get it. Ironically, that statement I just made that it's uh, arbitrary, capricious, and you can't predict who among the reservoir might get it is still true. Uh, the Supreme Court has changed. Our politics have changed since then. Uh, that 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 rule, however, that observation is is still true. It's just been declared that that doesn't violate the Constitution. So, in a way, you can say what is constitutional depends on what those nine people sitting in Washington D.C. Uh, under the banner "Equal Justice Under Law," which is what's carved above the entrance to the Supreme Court, it's what they say it is. I myself do not think it is constitutional, should be constitutional, primarily because of its violation of equal protection of the law, uh, which is guaranteed uh, not just by those words carved uh, in, the, in the door of the Supreme Court, but carved in the Constitution itself, which is, of course, the supreme law of the land. So it comes down to interpretation. If I were on the court, I would say that equal justice of the law is not being applied. Therefore, the death penalty is unconstitutional. The court doesn't agree with that view at this moment. Um, do you feel that defendants in capital cases have adequate legal representation? You feel that defendants in capital cases have adequate legal representation, Dean? Uh, it's going to vary from case to case, but I would say that uh, those people who are depending on public defenders in general do not have adequate representation, capital cases or otherwise, um, uh, because as is, uh, I think, been very clearly in, uh, established, uh, the overwhelming majority of public depend defenders setting aside the questions of their competence, have uh, uh, ridiculous workloads and, uh, and are unable to give enough attention to the individual cases. Uh, I have no reason to think that differs in the case of, of capital crimes. In fact, I've heard anecdotal stories that, that say it does not. And it is for that reason, which interestingly enough is, is in support of Michael's view, that the, the, the main question about the constitutionality of the issue should not be whether it's a cruel and unusual punishment, where I think most people would say it is not, uh, but rather whether it's equal justice under the law, where I would agree with him. It is not being applied equally, and that is one of the reasons. Yeah, uh, I can tell you uh, that I have worked on quite a number of capital cases, working on behalf of lawyers representing uh, capitally charged clients, and the quality of lawyering at the base level, at the first stage level, generally is very poor. And it is very poor because capital litigation is extremely uh, complicated. It is not like any lawyer can jump in and represent a capitally charged client any more than you would want a, uh, a doctor, an eye, ear, nose, and throat doctor to perform brain surgery. They're very different processes just because you're a doctor doesn't enable you or qualify you to do certain uh, tasks that other doctors are qualified to do. Similarly, uh, lawyers who have not practiced in capital litigation are not familiar with the history, are not familiar with what's required, are not familiar with uh, the conditions and the investigations that are needed, uh, often fall very far short. And one of the most common reasons for overturning 
capital cases uh, by appellate courts is the inadequacy of their counsel at trial. Those lawyers who didn't quite know what they were doing, even if they were doing the best that they could do, uh, what they knew wasn't adequate to the task at hand, wasn't adequate to perform the, the brain surgery that capital punishment defense is. So I think the quality of, uh, of uh, lawyering is very uneven, which is another uh, unequal protection of the law when those who can afford the best lawyering get it and those who cannot afford any lawyering get what they can afford which is uh, which is this uh, public defender's uh, system where the, each lawyer is terribly burdened with the number of cases and the difference in those cases uh, that requires difference in, le in legal strategy um, you know, California just two years ago voted, Californians voted to expand the, the use of the death penalty and expedite it um, in this great progressive state of California. And one of the provisions of that new expedited law is that any lawyer must accept a, a capital case uh, uh, appointment by a court. Well, that if that were to be held to be constitutional, it's, it's now being challenge. But if it were held to be constitutional, that would mean that the person who represents you in traffic court could also represent you in a capital case and you you would end up with a death sentence in that situation. Well, definitely a source of uh, very adamant agreement here between <laughs> the both of you. Um, a bit of a, a side question before uh, our, our last questions here, but I have seen this addressed as a question in, in um, discussions on the topic. Do you think that it violates the doctor's oath to participate mm. in the death penalty? Do you think that's an issue where the state forces a doctor to participate in, in the execution process, Dean? Uh, you know, I, I actually had not asked myself this question before. On the surface of it, it would seem to, uh, if you're to do no harm, it doesn't say do no harm to good people. It's to do no harm, period. So uh, it seems to me it would be a problem. And I notice that a lot of drug companies are refusing or trying to refuse to have their drugs being used in uh, lethal injections, which I think is... Um, one of the most common, if not the most common, means in the United States of administering the death penalty. Yeah, Dean, Dean you are absolutely right. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are uh, desperately trying to keep their names associated uh, from being associated with capital uh, homicide. Uh, European uh, Union forbids the uh, the selling of drugs to American states who will be using those drugs uh, on behalf of capital punishment to put someone to death. And in fact, it's become somewhat of a crisis uh, where states have tried to uh, quickly execute as many people as they can because they've run out of their killing drugs and cannot find sources for new ones. You're quite right that lethal injection has become the method of choice currently. We've moved from many different methods, each one I believe trying to make it easier on those of us who are standing around watching the process, not to make it easier on the, the person receiving the process. There have been plenty of botched lethal injections where it's taken hours to find a usable vein, uh, where uh, the injection went in the wrong way and created tremendous pain. Those kinds of, there is no easy way to kill a human being. There is no quick, a clean, easy way to do it. None has been found. Um, and so, uh, yes, I think that a doctor who takes the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm uh, must experience great, uh, I don't know, guilt if he or she is involved in a process uh, who, which, which results in the greatest harm you can do to a human being, which is to take that person's life. So I think we are at a collision course right now between the medical profession, which is uh, quite adamant in their views that doctors should not participate. Uh, uh, and doctors participate in virtually every execution. They listen to heartbeat. They declare when death occurs that that is a violation of their Hippocratic Oath seems very clear to me. And 
uh, I don't see how a, a conscientious doctor can participate in a process that kills a human being. So my last question to you two is what would you change about the death penalty in the US currently? What would you change? How would you make it uh, different, Dean? Okay, well, <clears throat> if I could, I would simply declare a uh, an indefinite moratorium and there would just, in practice, be no death penalty. Um, short of that, if I couldn't do that, I would at least try to make it more difficult so that it would only be applied in the most egregious cases, as I said, when there was a beyond a reasonable doubt, when the family uh, uh, did, chose not to, uh, you know, chose, chose to insist that for them, in their opinion, it was going to uh, help them uh, uh, to uh, uh, to deal with the uh, with their loss by having the person who was responsible to lose the same thing that he took away from from their beloved. Um, uh, and I think that uh, you know while I would prefer to see a, a total moratorium, uh, at least that would be a step in the right direction that could accelerate this process of the reduction of the number of. Um, um, capital punishments that we've been seeing uh, seeing in this country uh, and hopefully leave the remaining ones only uh, those where there was uh, at least, and I know this doesn't satisfy Michael, but at least they would be cases where the person was uh, irrefutably uh, guilty of something really, really horrible. Right. That you're correct. It wouldn't satisfy me, although it would be a, a step in the right direction. Of course, my solution, my uh, dictatorial uh, power being used would uh, eliminate the death penalty as a potential uh, tool that government could rely on. Um, one thing uh, I note is that when government is given any power, it abuses that power. I mean, may it, maybe it goes back to the you know, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there can be no more absolute power that a government employs than the power to select an individual of its own citizens and put that person to death. There can be no greater power. So the, uh, the uh, inclination for corruption uh, to misuse that power is always there and is going to happen. So I see no solution other than the solution of a complete abolition, although I certainly would accept uh, and applaud uh, the, the solutions that are proposed by Dean, which is a permanent moratorium, um, that, that would that would go a long way to satisfy uh, my objective, though not the full way. No, it seems it seems we have a shared, definitely have a shared pool of meaning and even some kind of uh, middle ground that everybody agree on. That's fabulous. Um, that's about it for today. Uh, if our audience would like to keep in touch with either of you or read more about your ideas or information, where would they reach out to, Dean? You can go to minaret.org or to blog.minaret.org. Dot org, uh, in order to see uh, uh, my writings and uh, those of my associates at the Mineral Writer Freedom Institute. And uh, I think uh, anyone who is interested in my writing or my point of view, it's partially reflected. I say that because it's a, it's a <laughs> it's an in progress uh, event. I have created a a, a web page. Uh, website, so it's it's young. It, it does not have a lot on it, but it has quite a bit on it, and that is www. Small case Michael hyphen a middle initial a hyphen Kroll K R O L L dot com Michael A Kroll dot com with hyphens in between the names, all in lowercase. So we'll definitely link to both in the description below. This was a roundtable conversation about uh, the death penalty. Thank you so much for participating. Imad Adin, representing the moralist pro position about the death penalty, and uh, Michael Kroll, representing the definitely under no circumstance uh, position uh, 
uh, regarding death penalty. I thank you very much for a very pleasant, very interesting, illuminating conversation. And I hope you all found it enjoyable. Have a great, great weekend, a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you, Tomer.